I'm Mike Farrington. Welcome back to the boardroom. In this video, I'm going to restore a 75 year old drill press to like new condition, and I'm going to add a few modern conveniences. By the looks of these radical pinstripes, I would assume that popular greaser Danny Zuko of Rydell High was the previous owner of this drill press. I would also assume that he used this very press to help build his hot rod greased lightning and would later famously go on to race and win at Thunder Road. After the wild and flagrant speculation about the previous owner, the first step in any restoration project is disassembly. Disassembly is always an exciting part of the restoration process. It's also when you either get good news or bad news. In this situation, I got some bad news. Fortunately, I was able to come up with a reasonable workaround. I'll go into that later in the video. But overall, for its age, this drill press is in very good condition. This is kind of a cool feature. In addition to the table raising and lowering, the head of the drill press can raise and lower. One thing that's quite obvious when looking at this drill press is how much effort and time Delta put into the design. And for something that's just designed to drill holes, it just seems like a lot of time and effort were put into all these castings and the design to make sure that it looked good but also functioned good. One thing that's less obvious in a video is quality. When taking this drill press apart, I was stunned at how nice all the castings were. There's no sharp edges, there's no voids, all the machining is really nice, the threads that have been cut, parts mate together really well. And that's just something that I don't see in tools that have been made in more modern times. And here's the moment of truth. Oftentimes these quill feeding gears I guess you'd call it, uh, they have teeth broken or missing. And in this situation, they were all good, just very dirty. One interesting tidbit that I learned while disassembling this drill press is that grease can actually dry out. And essentially what happens is the oil within the grease uh, runs out and goes away, and that leaves behind just the thickener, which is kind of a waxy substance that is no longer able to lubricate whatever it's supposed to be lubricating. This spanner nut at the bottom of the quill was the only challenge to remove. It was frozen in time and place. I ended up cutting a piece of 1 8 inch steel to the right length to fit into the two notches. And between that and a combination of PB blaster and a torch, not at the same time, I was able to break the nut loose. I didn't film any of that because of the plethora of four letter words that were coming out of my pie hole <laughs> during that process. At this point, I have a pile of parts that are coated in 75 years of grease, grime, grit, gunk, and a few other G words that I can't think of right now, so I move on to the cleaning phase. This gizmo is known as an ultrasonic cleaner. I fill it with simple green, and essentially it buzzes, or maybe better said, it agitates the liquid at a high rate of speed. This makes for easy and very thorough cleaning of small parts. With the column, I was too close for missiles, so I switched to sandpaper. I used some 600 grit wet dry with some simple green as a lubricant, and this shined up nicely. I briefly tried Ace Tone as a degreaser, but I didn't think it was worth the extra smell that was put off into the shop. Quick side note about Ace Tone. That's going to be the name of my new cover band, and we're going to cover late 80s and early 90s rap songs. After airing the stench out of my shop from the Ace Tone, I decided to just go back to full strength Simple Green and I would soak parts in an appropriately sized dish. After the degreasing phase, I decided to sandblast a few of the parts just to give them a better chance at good paint adhesion. These uh, little sandblasters are great. You can pick them up for like 15 bucks. The catch is they use a ton of air. You need a gigantic compressor to run them. And I just shoot good old fashioned play sand. I use two 50 pound bags to sandblast all these parts. 
Well, with the paint and pinstripes removed, this shot reminded me of the helmet the guy wore in the movie The Rocketeer, which, by the way, was the second best movie of 1991. Once the parts were all cleaned and ready to go, it was time for primer. I did two coats of primer on everything and then I moved on to the top coat. This color is called Smoke Gray. It's a Rust-Oleum color and it's kind of a battleship type gray when you see it in person. I thought it worked well for the Delta vintage look. I ended up doing three coats. I let the paint dry overnight, and the next day I come back and begin assembly. And I run a tap in and out of each of the threaded holes on every part just to clear out any paint or gunk that had built up over the 75 years of this mighty drill press's life. The first two parts to go back onto the column are this stop collar and this crazy bearing. Together these parts allow the work table to rotate around the column and are the course height adjustment. And my next move is to reassemble the thingamajiggy that holds the work table to the column. This is the gear set that drives the table up and down. The side where the handle is attached rides on a bearing and this makes cranking the table up and down pretty darn easy. This little pin that holds the worm gear in the correct position on the shaft has a taper to it and of course when I was taking this apart I didn't realize that the pin was tapered and naturally as luck would have it I picked the wrong side to start wailing on it when it came time to take it apart. And I was unable to get a hammer in there to set the pin, so I ended up using a spring-loaded nail set. I added a copious amount of blue raspberry flavored grease, and then I was ready to assemble the two halves. But of course, I forgot to chase a couple of the threads, so I took care of that. Here's a quick look at all the gears spinning, and after cleaning and re-lubrication, the handle turns as smooth as malt liquor. After the table support was installed, I moved on to reassembly of the head. Okay, here's where the bad news I mentioned earlier comes into play. The gear that raises and lowers the head had a few broken teeth. I guess Danny Zuko, the previous owner, clocked everything in such a way that the head could be moved up and down a couple of inches without contacting the broken teeth, if that makes sense. That also explains why I didn't catch it when I was inspecting this prior to purchase. I could have reassembled it the same way, but I decided to remove the feature altogether. After giving it some thought, I realized that the drill press is a little low for my liking anyway. Lowering the head would only make that worse. So I made the choice to bolt the head on in the highest position and I would rely on the table for height adjustments. Well, after the broken teeth fiasco, I regained my composure, I dried the tears from my eyes, and I got back to work. Next step was to install the plate that the motor mounts to. Here I'm adjusting the length of one of two spacers within the quill. 
this spacer adds preload to the two bearings that the spindle spins on. After disassembly, I realized I couldn't get the same bearings that were originally installed in the machine. They have this funky offset where one side is recessed and the other side is protruding. I was able to source these standard ball bearings and a couple of spacers to help with the protruding side, but that didn't help with the recessed side. So what is it exactly I'm doing here? Well, ball bearings have some slop built into them. These two spacers, if set to the proper length and installed correctly, allow the bearings to spin freely but eliminate that slop. This is accomplished by the inner spacer holding the inner bearing races together firmly and the outer spacer being slightly shorter will pull the outer races closer together putting a very slight pressure or preload onto the bearings. This will mush the balls within the ball bearing against the grooves that they're running in, which in turn eliminates slop and makes the drill press spin with very little run out. If I had to guess, in the 75 years since this drill press was constructed, a better system for putting preload on bearings has been devised. It looked to me like these spacers were actually hand adjusted at the time of original assembly. I based that on some file marks that I found on the ends of the spacers. That would be way too labor intensive for today's world. Okay, and as this spanner nut is tightened up, this is actually what clamps the outer races to that spacer that I was adjusting earlier. And the end result should be a spindle that spins freely, but there is no play when lateral force is applied. I ended up taking this guy apart three times and adjusting the spacers a few thousands at a time until I got to that point. This is something I did by feel because I don't have the tools to measure and cut accurately enough. I'm no expert at this, so time will tell if I did a good job or if I put too much preload on the bearings and they wear out prematurely. Of course, I can always redo it, and the bearings are only 11 bucks, so it's not a huge loss if I made a mistake. If at this point you're questioning my sanity and wondering why put all this work into a crusty old drill press, why not just go buy a shiny new one? You'd have a valid point for sure. My retort would be that I just really like doing this kind of a project, bringing a tool back to life, learning exactly how it works and the sense of satisfaction when it looks and works as good as new. Well, I guess you could say that really launches my rocket. It's probably similar to why people restore old cars. I think this is a cool system. This worm gear allows the return spring to be installed while not under tension. Then by turning this little guy 10 million times, you slowly build up spring tension until the quill returns at a suitable speed. Then simply tighten the set screw to hold the setting. I think it's about time for a song recommendation. It's My Life by the band Talk Talk is a cool mid-80s English new wave song. You're probably more familiar with the cover version that was done by Orange County, California ska band, no doubt. Being that I grew up in the OC, I am duty-bound to no doubt fandom, but between you and me, I think I prefer the original. This part is what transmits power from the motor to the quill. The splines on the lower portion of the shaft mesh with the quill and allow it to move up and down and spin at the same time. After using my Herculean strength to install the table and a few other small parts, it was time to move on to the last major task of this restoration and where I would bring this drill press into the 21st century, maybe even the 22nd century. Two things this drill press lacked was a good light and an easy way to change speeds. And to me, adjusting the belt isn't easy. I built this bracket you see here before you with a few pieces of 3 16 inch thick steel because I'm hardcore and 1 8 inch thick is for wimps. 
I use the same holes that the motor mounts to. I then drilled the required holes to mount a super duper cool LED light as well as a variable frequency drive or VFD. And the VFD makes speed changes a simple turn of a knob. A quick note about this particular VFD, it can take 120 volt single phase electricity and by way of some ancient sorcery, it can then output 208 volt three phase power. Catch is it only works up to one horsepower, which is convenient for me because I'm powering this drill press with a one horsepower three phase motor. As of the making of this video, I've been using the drill press for a couple of weeks. Overall, I'm tickled pink with the end result. The light's easy to get to and it works as it should. The VFD makes speed changes, easy peasy lemon squeezy. It drills accurately and so far it hasn't fallen apart. I'm also pleased as punch with the bracket for the VFD and light. It's stout and it's located in a comfortable position. Still left to do is build a woodworker style table with an adjustable fence. I also want to build a five inch or so tall base to lift the entire press up a bit. I think it would make ergonomics much better, but that's not the fault of the drill press. It's mine for being nine feet tall. Thank you very much for watching. Until next time.